Good evening and welcome to yet another Southwest Africa webinar. My name is Freddie Mashate and I am your host this evening. Thank you for joining us once again. This session is brought to you by Southwest Africa. And of course, it is part of the first ever in 24 years virtual festival, a journey that started in October and has up to this date brought so much wealth in knowledge, in inspiration and in entertainment. If you've missed any of our previous offerings, please be sure to visit um, uh, our website where all our previous events are stored for your convenience. Today's session, traditional fishing methods of Africa as an example of indigenous knowledge systems. Really, really exciting. The webinar will discuss extraordinary variety of traditional methods for catching marine and freshwater fish and shellfish that developed in Africa as well as their role in sustainable use of valuable aquatic resources. It will further be argued that traditional fishing methods should be conserved just as living aquatic resources are conserved so that these traditional practices do not go extinct and will continue to be used to harvest aquatic resources in relatively sustainable ways. This presentation has been prepared and will be presented to you by Professor Mike Bruton. He is a retired scientist who now spends his time writing popular science books in his garden in Cape Town. Mike has recently authored a book called Traditional Fishing Methods of Africa, which is the first comprehensive overview of this topic for over 50 years. In this book, he highlights the extraordinary, the extraordinary variety of traditional fishing methods that have been developed on the continent and calls for their conservation really, really excited. Um, if you're watching us on Facebook, please be sure to share the stream. If there is someone that you know should be watching, please be sure to just type their name in the comment section and Facebook will be sure to uh, notify them. If you're watching us from Zoom, please be free to interact with us, use the Q&A function. And once uh, Mike has finished presenting his presentation, we will have uh, time to attend to questions. At this point, allow me to hand over to Mike. Mike, thank you very much for honoring our invitation. And once again, uh, welcome to the platform. The platform is all yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, Freddy. It's a great honor to once again be part of your online SciFest program. Um, and as you mentioned, I will be talking about traditional fishing methods of Africa. Now, fishing is one of the most ancient forms of hunting. In fact, it probably preceded hunting of mammals and birds because relatively simple tools can be used for uh, fishing. In fact, some of the very earliest tools invented by modern humans some 70,000 years ago um, which include glues, poisons, spears, bows and arrows, and traps. All of those were used for fishing. And we're very fortunate that in Africa, we have this huge diversity of plants and animals. And the um, incredible knowledge that African people have of this biota is the basis for our, um, our traditional knowledge systems. This is the book on which um, I'm basing my talk, Traditional Fishing Methods of Africa. And I'd like to acknowledge the many ichthyologists and fishery scientists around Africa who helped me uh, compile this book. Now, just to put things in perspective, um, small scale fisheries, both in marine and fresh waters, represent two thirds of the global fish catch, including shellfish. So it's a very important source of animal protein. And in Africa, um, aquatic uh, resources provide food security for over 200 million people. And another 10 million are involved in after catch activities, uh, such as um, cooking and distributing and selling. So marine and freshwater resources are a very important uh, nutritional safety web um, in the developing world. I first developed my interest in traditional fishing methods when I was based at Lake Sabaya, which is a large freshwater lake on the uh, coast of northeastern Zululand between St. Lucia and the Cozy system. And there my assistant Nelson and Gletcher and I 
we actually used some traditional fishing methods to catch fishes uh, for our studies. Here he is paddling out uh, to our long lines, which we used to catch this catfish. I also had the opportunity to travel widely in Southern Africa to observe the behavior of catfish and other fishes. And we looked at this on the left is the ovary of a catfish with tens of thousands of eggs. And we also studied hippos and crocodiles and birds and things. Since then, I've used every opportunity when I've traveled to African countries, both underwater and above water to look at traditional fishing methods. The lower photograph, I'm even riding a bicycle around the shores of Zanzibar, uh, looking for examples of these methods and visiting fish markets. Uh, the history of traditional fishing methods uh, in Africa can be divided into these categories. Prehistoric, um, Egypt, and it's quite astounding how many firsts Egypt has in terms of uh, the first recorded use of different fishing gears, such as spears and traps and uh, fishing rods and hooks, etc. Then there was a pre-colonial era, very important on, in the IKS context, a colonial era, a post-colonial and now the modern. And unfortunately, modern, during a modern era, very many harmful fishing methods have been introduced into Africa, which are causing damage to aquatic resources. Now let's go back to the prehistoric. One can imagine, you know, hunter-gatherers coming from the inland areas and looking down at the coast at this rich resource that they could access with fairly simple gear, such as spears and gaffs, and even with their hands in the intertidal zone. And um, it's widely regarded that uh, marine and other um, aquatic food contributed to the development of intelligence in humans. So there we see an artist's impression of um, these early hunter-gatherers walking in the shallow water and spearing fishes. And we have evidence of what they caught in the middens that they've left around the South African coast. There are over 3,000 documented middens, and there are probably many more along our coastline. And these are basically not only kitchen refuse dumps where the shells of animals that had been caught and eaten were dumped, but they also in a way are technology hubs because they left behind the tools they used to catch fish and shellfish and also cook them and process them. So middens are a very important source of information about those early uh, fishermen. There are also other evidence of early uh, fishing. Here is a cave painting from Mount Fletcher from about 35,000 years before present. And you can clearly see fishermen with long spears um, trying to spear fish. There's another one from the same sort of era from Pongweni Mountain in KZN. And once again, there they seem to have arranged their canoes in such a way that they, they are uh, herding the fish um, and making them um, easier to catch. Here's a, a rock engraving from a tomb uh, over 4,500 years old from Egypt. And here they're using a more advanced method. Um, they're using a, a lift net uh, to um, catch fishes in shallow water. And here, uh, an even more advanced method from a fishing scene from Egypt, uh, where they're using a kind of entanglement net or gill net to harvest fish. Now, of course, Africa is an ideal place to go fishing. It has a coastline over 30,000 kilometers long, seven great rivers, including the second longest river in the world, the Nile, huge lakes, including Lake Victoria, which is the biggest surface area of any freshwater lake, um, and, and large wetlands, such as the Okavango Delta, the Banguelo swamps, and so on. So there are many aquatic habitats in which fishes and shellfishes can live. And if one takes a look into the buckets of the fishermen from different African countries, this is what you see, an amazing variety of fish and shellfish that they catch. And it's also very instructive to visit fish markets. Here's one, for instance, on Lake Victoria in Kenya, uh, the clinker built boats coming in with their catch. And there's a, a scene, a more up market um, facility. This is on in Stonetown in Zanzibar. And I can tell you that those kebabs uh, are among the most delicious 
uh, things I've ever tasted in my life. Now, here are some illustrations of common freshwater fishes that are caught using traditional methods in Southern Africa. Uh, the three sprot bream, Mozambique tilapia, African pike, various catfish, and also the lungfish. And there's some more, uh, Churchill and Lake Tanganyika sardine are freshwater fishes, uh, and the others are examples of marine fishes. Uh, but hundreds and hundreds of species are caught by traditional fishermen. It's not only fishes that are caught, turtles, um, dugongs, and even hippos are, are killed uh, for food, although in most countries that's no longer legal. Now, the kinds of traditional fishing methods, I've just listed some of them here, and they can be divided into two categories. Firstly, passive um, methods. This is where you, you put out the uh, net or the poison or the line, and the fish must swim towards it in order to get caught. Whereas the active methods are ones where uh, you move towards a fish, or you throw something at it, or you, you scoop it or um, sustain it or purse it. Um, so they, the fisherman has to be active in, in going towards the fish. And I'll be going through some of those methods um, in this talk. Now, of course, the simplest way to collect shellfish and, and, and fish is if you can do it by hand. And here's a woman in Zanzibar collecting scallops from the sand at low tide. Coconut crabs, which are giant crabs, live um, on trees uh, off the East African coast. They're nocturnal, so they're only active at night, um, and they are quite powerful and got a big nipper, but you can catch them by hand. Another interesting early example of a traditional fishing method are these tidal fish traps, which can be found in the Southern Cape, especially near Still Bay. And what has been done here is that piles of rocks have been arranged in these arcs and at high tide the water goes over the top of the rocks and the fish swim in uh, to the kraal and then when the tide recedes the fish are trapped and then can be caught you by hand or using spears and nets. Now oddly enough these traps although they're still catching fish people are not allowed to harvest the fish from them. Um, this is seen as a conservation measure but I really believe that the sustainable harvesting of, of common fishes, such as some of the mullet species, uh, should be allowed in these tidal fish traps. And there's another view of them. You can see how large they are. Now, an interesting innovation recently is this kind of tidal trap, but it's on a freshwater river. It's on the Orange River, uh, just below the Van der Kloof Dam. And when water is released uh, from the dam, it uh, floods over the rocks and the, the water flowing down the river also stimulates the fish to swim upriver, and some fish get trapped uh, inside the rock crawl and there they can be caught. This is another example of using rocks and, and broken up coral. Uh, it's an artificial reef that's been created in the intertidal zone in Zanzibar and at high tide uh, fishes come along and they feed in all the little nooks and crannies in among the rocks and coral and there they can more easily be caught. And this is a much more sophisticated version uh, of a thing called a fish aggregation device where you hang these streamers in the water and they attract fishes and they become easier to harvest. Um, the, the famous South African dollars is now used to create um, underwater uh, fish aggregation devices. Um, they, they, in Algoa Bay, for instance, dollars have been put in fairly deep water and they create an artificial reef where fishes congregate. Another common method that's of catching fish, it's been traditionally used in Africa for centuries, is the use of poison derived from naturally um, plants that live on the continent. And the sap and, and the juice from leaves and branches, roots and seed pods, for instance, of this tree called the fish poison bean can be used uh, to catch fish. On the right, we see uh, the milk bush or euphorbia and uh, leaves of that can be chopped up and thrown into the water as fish poison, as well as the bark from the tomboti tree and seeds from the coral tree. And there you can see chopped up bits of euphorbia in a pond and they'll cause the fish um, to run out of oxygen and uh, come to the surface and be caught. 
other examples of uh, traditional fish poisons, bark from the physic nut tree, the sap from the impala lily, beans from the African dream herb, or entada bean, and bark and seeds from the violet tree. So there are many, many species of plants that can be used as fish poisons. Uh, the beech poison vine is another example, and the torchwood tree. Now, just for interest, many of those poisons, technically, uh, they are illegal to use, but in fact, most uh, traditional fishermen are continuing to use them um, if it's practical. And I think used carefully and, and with due knowledge, uh, it's not a problem for them to continue to be used. Uh, one of the simplest tools used for catching fish is the fishing spear. It differs from the spears used to catch mammals because it has these recurved um, teeth on it so that uh, the fish can't wiggle off the end of the spear. And once again, this goes back very far in, in ancient Egypt. Uh, this is a um, painting in a tomb 3,300 years before present. And the fish are painted in such detail that we can identify them as Nile tilapia. And they're being speared from papyrus rafts. And there's a typical scene in the upper Zambezi River. You'll see all over Africa with simple homemade spears a uh, wooden shaft and a metal uh, point, and they've been um, spearing the sharp tooth catfish. And there's a spear fisherman uh, taking home, uh, taking his catch to market on the beach in Zanzibar uh, with his spear tied to his bicycle. Now, a very interesting derivation of the spear, of, of the um, spear fishing in Africa is the so-called dark hut method. And um, this, you can see the man is inside a hut and he looks down this long shaft and he can see the fish in the shadow. So they're visible to him underwater. And uh, th this method is, was apparently very efficient, but it's one of many African uh, traditional fishing methods that has gone extinct. Um, it no longer exists. Uh, there were previously four or 500 of these dark huts in the upper Zambezi, now they're none. Another method is using fishing bow and arrows. This is from the Kavango River in uh, Botswana. Um, and interestingly, although there are examples of bow fishing and even crossbow fishing in Southern Africa and West Africa, this is a method that's not extensively used in Africa, whereas it's very common in South America and parts of Southeast Asia. Uh, I've personally used uh, bow fishing to catch fishes under certain circumstances, but it's only really practical in shallow water or with fishes swimming near the surface. It's very common, for instance, um, in the Philippines, and there you can see Filipino bow fishermen uh, in their canoe. Now, one step on from the spear is a gaff, and here's a fisherman in Zanzibar who is caught an octopus with a gaff. And there's a, a gentleman up in, I think it's in Zambia. Uh, he's got a gaff with a trigger mechanism. So that's a, uh, another innovation. Then the, the next method I'll look at is using a rod or pole fishing. And once again, we can see the tomb paintings um, from Egypt. And they appear to be catching squeakers uh, on a group of catfish uh, using uh, hand lines and also a rod and line. And on the right, I put a photograph of an amazing fishing rod that I found that a young fisherman had made at Villanculus in Mozambique. The entire fishing rod was made from indigenous plant fiber and stems and thorns, etc. Uh, even the reel. And there's a typical scene, a cozy bay, a young fisherman using a simple pole, a line and a baited hook. There are some elaborations on the, the fishing rod. This is a gourd rattle alarm. So they put out a number of lines and um, fix the rod in the, in the sand. And when a fish strikes, uh, the gourd rattles and they can quickly run over and retrieve the fish. Our fishing hooks have taken many forms over the years. Before metal and wire was available, uh, traditional fishermen in Africa used the claws of eagles, they used thorns, even the horn on rhinoceros beetles, um, and porcupine claws. 
And there on the top left, you can see the thorns of the Yalala palm tree, which are used for fishing. And then on the right are, is something called a gorge, which is different from a fish hook um, in that it's attached to the line. The fish swallows it with the bait and then it uh, goes down longwise and then turns sideways and gets caught in the fish's gullet. So the fish can be uh, hauled in shore. And many fishermen in Africa still use gorges instead of hooks. Uh, this is a, an amazing uh, compound hook from the Pacific Islands, uh, a classic example of uh, indigenous knowledge and practice. Um, and the one on the right is from Hawaii. Um, so far, I have found no evidence of these compound hook hooks having been made in Africa. Well, that's an early drawing of a um, fisherman uh, with a uh, line and hooks. And you can see the hooks have got eyes on them but they haven't got a notched point. And it, it seems uh, from our research that um, notched pointed um, hooks only were only used in Africa after they could have been, they could be introduced from Europe. Then we move on to a whole additional area of traditional fishing methods, and that is fish traps. And probably the simplest one of those shown top left, that's a, a trap made from, uh, cylindrical bark um, and bait is put inside. And on the right, you can see very similar bark traps from China. This is one of the kinds of um, fish traps called a constriction trap. Um, it has no valve at the opening. It's just a uh, cylinder that gets progressively um, narrower and the fish swims or is washed into the trap and can't get out again. And these are traps that are specifically made for one species of fish, the snake catfish um, in the uh, Kavango. This is a more typical constriction trap, a very long one. You can see that tapering cylindrical um, structure and a wide uh, mouth, and it is put into the river facing upstream and the fish get trapped below. And typically these uh, bunical traps are put in, in barriers like that in rapids uh, where fish, uh, where the water movement is strong. There's another example of that. And some of the most famous traditional fish traps in the world are found on the Congo River, where they make these barricades and they suspend the traps from them. And you can see it must be a very dangerous and hair raising occupation. You wouldn't want to get washed away into the rapids. The other group of fish traps are called valve traps. They have a valve um, of overlapping sticks or, or, or reeds uh, at the entrance. The fish can easily force its way into the trap, but it can't um, come back out again because the sticks uh, point inwards. So there's an illustration of the, the valve that the fish go through. If you look at the trap side on, they beautifully made a lattice work of, of reeds and sticks different uh, plant materials to make traps. And if you look at the back of the trap, uh, this is a removable um, door uh, that you can use to retrieve the fish. And these valve traps come in, in, in many different forms. There's uh, one for small fishes in Lake Malawi. Uh, on the right is a valve trap um, from the Congo River. This is the so-called Madeira trap uh, from Zanzibar. And there you can see fishermen bringing the Madeira traps back to shore. And these are, are cleverly made in that they're collapsible uh, so that they can easily be stored. And they're used for catching uh, fishes as well as crabs. Um, this is slightly different variation on that, the so-called fish pots where the entrance is on top, used in the Kafui River. And then this is yet another variation and these are movable fish traps that can be folded up and carried and then reinstalled and they're installed together with reed barriers. Another famous set of um, fish traps in Africa is the uh, cozy fish traps, the palisade fish traps on the estuary of the cozy uh, system up in extreme northeastern Zululand near the Mozambique border. And you can see they've created these barriers that guide the fish around a semicircle and into the trap. There you can see that pattern again where the fish are moving with the tide uh, will be guided into the trap. 
and there's a close-up and you can see the trap leading into the, the final enclosure. Then other kinds of things that are handmade from natural fibers include these push baskets, which are mainly used by women, which they use for um, either pushing through, uh, in this case, a uh, lily pond or wetlands. And there's another variation of that, a, a kind of a filter that's been made from natural fibers um, that's used to catch fishes. This is a pool basket also used in, in densely vegetated shallow water. Then yet another kind of fishing basket is the so-called thrust basket. And this is the Isifonia version of it that's used on the Pongolo floodplain in northern Zululand. And it's used in a totally different way. In the past, Isifonia fishing drives on the Pongola River, and this is a photograph from the 1950s by Paul Dutton, um, hundreds of people would participate and they'd form a line across a shallow uh, floodplain pan. And they would herd the fishes, which became more and more concentrated, and then they would catch them in the thrust basket. And the way they catch fish, as these women are demonstrating, is that they push the basket down into the water, they thrust it down, and then they take the fish out of the hole in the top, and then they hang their catch on their belt. And they, you can see they've caught some nice catfish. Now, I participated in some of these Fonia fish drives in, in the Pongola, and they're quite hazardous because, of course, in that habitat, you also find crocodiles, hippos, you find leeches, the tiger fish that bite your fingers, there are sharp thorns to tramp on, so it's quite a hazardous experience. Now, sadly, these Fonia fishing drives, which are were a very important uh, communal tradition among the Amatonga people, are dying out. Whereas previous Fonia drives, uh, hundreds of people participated and it was a very important event in the community. Now it's just a, a dozen or so people um, take part and. Unless we do something about it, this method of fishing is going to go completely extinct. Thrust baskets come in various designs. There's a tall one. Um, you can see also some plastic being used on the one on the right. And they're used in these various forms throughout Africa. Uh, there you can see Songo thrust baskets from the upper Zambezi. And here are some from Capribi uh, in Namibia, um, a slightly different design. And yet again, you can see how important it is as a communal fishing activity. And of course, fishing methods are combined in order to optimize the catch. So here you have thrust baskets and spears being used. And there's a typical catch from the thrust baskets, in this case, uh, mainly uh, catfish. Then moving on, uh, let's go on to nets, which are another important category of traditional fishing methods. These are some very interesting triangular lift nets that you thrust into the water and then you lift up um, to catch the fish. Uh, they, as you see from the stamp, the top left, they also use in Samoa and, and the Pacific region. And here's a, another kind of triangular lift net. This is used in the rapids in the uh, Congo River. Once again, it looks like it's very hazardous. And you can see the intense uh, communal activity taking place um, in this shallow wetland, people are using their hands and also their, their lift nets. Right, let's then go on to another category of nets called entanglement nets and gill nets. Uh, they were made uh, traditionally using natural fibers uh, as the rope and also the twine and using um, rocks and, and coral as weight. Uh, there's a natural rock net weight on the left from Hans Bay. And then the fishing net floats would have been made from the wood of, for instance, the low-filled chestnut tree. But sadly, these um, relatively inefficient uh, gill nets made from indigenous plant fibers have been replaced by multifilament and now monofilament gill nets. And what's more, coral is being used as the rock weights, which is a further disaster. Now these gill nets, nylon gill nets, are very, very efficient and they are one of the biggest threats to aquatic resources in Africa, both in freshwater and marine environments. There you can see uh, multi-filament gill nets um, being dried. 
and there's one being used by a fisherman and also monofilament gill nets, uh, that one in Zanzibar being used as a seine net. And here's this is an example of the giant monofilament gill nets being used in Zanzibar, which absolutely decimate um, the fish fauna. You can see the chap in the middle there, he's a fan of Ronaldo. Gill nets are also used to encircle uh, fishes and especially around artificial reefs and um, they're, they're, they're very efficient at doing that as well. Now, some African countries are starting to ban or restrict the use of monofilament gill nets because they are so devastatingly effective. And the, the dilemma is that one can hardly blame a fisherman for using the most effective method of catching a fish. Because if a traditional fisherman persists in using a handmade nets from natural plant fibers, and then someone else comes along with a highly efficient gill net, um, he really can't compete with them. So it's, it's up to the authorities to regulate and control the, the use of these devastatingly effective nets. Another bad example is the use of mosquito nets as fish nets in Africa. As we know, uh, mosquito bed nets are distributed by the million in the continent. They're either given away free or can be bought um, for very little. And many of them are never used as bed nets. They go straight into the water and are used as seine nets. And this, once again, is something that the authorities are starting to legislate again. And even um, cloth uh, used for making clothes is, is used um, as a kind of seine net by young fishermen in the intertidal zone in Zanzibar. Now, an unusual way of, of uh, catching fishes, which is not very common anymore, is to use live animals to catch fishes. Um, for instance, the remora or sucker fish, they were tethered and on a line and then released, and they would suck onto turtles, and the fishermen could then pull the turtle in and harvest the turtle. And around the Canary Islands and other parts of uh, off the coast of Northwest Africa, Dolphins are used to herd fishes into nets. And then the, the image on the lower right, I don't have any evidence for the use of this in Africa, but they, um, they in, in Taiwan and Thailand and elsewhere, they use cormorants to catch fish. And the cormorants have a ring around their neck so that they can't swallow the fish. And they come back to the boat of the fisherman and the fisherman pops it into the basket. Now, of course, once you've caught your fish, you've got to process it, cook it, preserve it in some way, uh, either to eat it on the spot or save it for a future meal. And there are many different ways, uh, traditional methods of fish processing that have been developed in Africa. Um, the one I'm illustrating here is, is uh, smoking um, of eels over, over a fire. And there you can see other examples of um, the kind of fire and the basket that they use for smoking fish. Smoking fish is a very effective um, preservation method, and it also gives a lovely flavor to the fish according to which wood you use uh, in the fire uh, to make the smoke. Um, fish are often, um, fish and shellfish are cut up and dried. Um, they dried in the sun, often they salted and then dried. And this is quite an effective um, preservation method in the warmer parts of Africa. And here on, in Zanzibar are some flag tails. They're being put onto these sticks and they will also be smoked and or dried um, before they're eaten. And curried uh, fish is a very popular dish um, throughout Africa. Uh, these are labios, uh, which are in a lovely looking curry uh, with onions and so on. It's not only a good preservation method, but it makes the, the fish very tasty. And of course, if you're going to fish offshore, you need a boat. And here are some young boat builders learning the skills. And this is an example of the earliest uh, boats that have been recorded. Um, the one on the top left is made from papyrus, and they were particularly commonly used in Egypt. Uh, top right. Um, is a palm frond made from the fronds of the raffia palm, and then bottom right is a log raft. These are all simple 
uh, kinds of boats that one can use to go out onto the water. And there's an artist's impression of some pretty um, amazing papyrus boats that we use in ancient Egypt. The smaller ones in the foreground are being used by fishermen. And there you can see uh, using a lift net between two papyrus rafts to harvest the fish. Bark canoes have also been used. They're quite rare nowadays. This is in the Mozambique. Looks a little bit precarious, uh, but that is one way of floating. But dugout canoes are really the main way of making um, small boats on African lakes and rivers and the seashore for catching fish. But of course, to make a decent sized dugout canoe, you need a big tree. And in many African countries, big trees are now very scarce and um, the opportunity to make large enough dugouts is greatly reduced. The dugouts come in various forms. Some of them um, on rivers are very wide um, and have a lot of space for storage. Others um, are very narrow and you sit on top of the dugout with your feet in the, in the hull. And uh, this is uh, a Zimbawera, which is a seasonal floating house of fishermen on Lake Chilwe in Malawi, where they spend part of the year catching fish and then they go back to their homes on the mainland. Now, this is an amazing photograph taken by Paul Skelton of a metal canoe made from the wingtip fuel tank of a jet fighter during the Angolan War. This fighter was shot down, this fellow found the wing tank and he's made a canoe out of it. Of course, um, canoes aren't very stable. So if you want to make it um, more stable, especially in rough seas, you put outriggers on it, either one or two outriggers. And you can also have a mast and a sail. And some um, of these outrigger dugouts even have outboard motors now. And I've done quite a lot of research in the Camors. And there you can see in the top right, a traditional fisherman in his double outrigger out, um, canoe, dugout canoe. And they have hand lines up to a thousand meters long, and they're mainly fishing for oil fish, but they occasionally catch coelacanths as well. These are fiberglass replica dugout canoes that are now used in the Okavango swamps in Botswana. And one of the reasons, of course, is there's simply not enough big trees around. So this is a conservation measure by introducing these fiberglass replicas, uh, trees are going to be looked after. You can add a latine sail to your dhow to um, go further and faster. These are very common off the east coast of Africa. And then you can go into um, wooden uh, boats uh, also with outriggers and latine sails uh, for offshore work. It's quite interesting that the wood is used um, to make these uh, boats, these dhows. Uh, mangrove wood is very important because of the angles that that wood naturally forms and the fact that it doesn't rot in seawater. And many of the uh, fishermen who use dowers that I've come across in East Africa are still using homemade coir rope, although nylon rope is becoming more common. There, the old and the new chap on a surf paddle ski uh, coming to his outrigger um, dower. There's a modern a wooden sailing boat in Zanzibar with its big gill net inside. In the Comores, various um, European and Japanese aid agencies have tried to improve the efficiency of fishing. Uh, on the left is a Japawa, which is a fiberglass inboard powered boat, uh, but they were a disaster uh, because nobody knew how to maintain them. And then on the right, the outboard powered boats, which um, allow the fishermen to go further out to sea. There are many other unusual traditional fishing methods that I haven't had a chance to mention. Um, fish parks in West Africa, which were the first forms of um, aquaculture. They were basically a park, parts of the sea which were fenced off and they threw branches in to attract fishes. Gravity traps, spring traps, falling door traps, vertical screens to catch jumping tiger fish. Uh, in the Bavenda have created a fishing rod without a line. It's just a rod with a hook on the end and they dip it in the water with bait and catch fish. Uh, in the Loango Valley, they, they put bell alarms on their rods, um, triangular gill nets, 
and multi-pocket chain nets, the innovations are just endless. Now I'd like to end with a comments on some of the harmful modern fishing practices that are damaging our aquatic resources. Firstly, blast fishing illustrated on the right, increasing use of explosives, or, uh, especially off the East African coast, um, even in the Comores, but so far not recorded from Madagascar. Poisoning with insecticides such as DDT. I've mentioned the use of mosquito nets and monofilament gill nets, illegal giant trawl nets. Ghost fishing is a serious threat. Ghost fishing occurs when a trap or a net is lost at sea or in a lake, but continues to catch fishes and shellfishes after it's been abandoned. And it's been estimated that the loss to ghost fishing is almost as great as the loss uh, of aquatic uh, resources to commercial fishing. And then swamp hoeing and coral harvesting. There you can see swamp hoeing where they're basically digging up a swamp, uh, which obviously destroys the habitat. They're looking for bulbs and corms, uh, but the fish suffer. The use of oil and modern pesticides, unfortunately, becoming increasingly common. The use of nylon um, mosquito nets to make traps is also becoming an issue. And here's an example of ghost fishing where a turtle has been caught in an abandoned net and will eventually die if it's not rescued. And here's a photo of a, uh, a boat with illegal giant trawl nets um, fishing off the West African coast. And here are photos taken that I took in Zanzibar um, of coral being harvested um, to make um, bricks and, and mortar. So to end with the deadly pattern that's unfortunately being followed in many parts of Africa is that traditional fishing methods are being replaced by monofilament gill nets, giant seine and trawl nets, and there's increasing use of poisons and explosives. And obviously this is a combination that is not sustainable. And in terms of the future of traditional fishing methods, it's very important that we we are respectful of the long ancestry and their value as indigenous knowledge systems, their importance as a cultural heritage, and their role in sustainably harvesting aquatic resources. We need to look at more hybrid technologies where some of the advantages of modern gear can be combined with traditional gear. And we also need to uh, see it as a human rights issue that people who are custodians of a resource should have the right to harvest that resource on a sustainable basis. And of course, education is absolutely crucial. And here's an example of marine guide trainees um, in Zanzibar being taught about a marine conservation. So I'll end it there. Thank you very much for listening and back to you, uh, Freedy. Wow. Um... Thank you. Thank you very much, Mike, uh, for such an informative session, um, which really was exposing some of the great innovations that are found in the traditional fishing space. It was, it was really amazing. And just to those that are watching, please do send uh, through your questions. If you have any questions that emanated from the presentation or related questions, please do send them through using the Q&A function on Zoom. And if you're on Facebook, please do just comment on the comment section. We will be monitoring that too, and we'll be able to share your questions with, um, with Mike. Here. Um, I think a good place to start, uh, Prof, is to just question if there are any you know, traditional methods that are still being used in South Africa uh, in this day and age? Well, the, perhaps the most significant ones are those palisade fish traps that are still being used in the Cozy Bay estuary. And they are being actively conserved as part of the Isimangaliso uh, wetland park. And um, you know, I think that's our best example. That similar method used to be used in Richards Bay and even Durban's Bay in the past. Uh, but it's no longer used there. And then there are examples in in um, in Limpopo um, and in uh, Pomalanga of traditional fish traps still in use. In the Pongola floodplain in Zululand, the Isifonia thrust baskets are being used, but on a much reduced scale. And of course, spears and simple fishing rods are, are widely in use. But one really has to go up to the Okavango 
and then to countries like Zambia, where there are lots of large rivers, wetlands and lakes and up to the Great Lakes of Africa to see the, the full diversity of, of traditional fishing methods. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm, I'm just interested to know, especially in these areas where these traditional fishing methods are still being used, is it a lack of access to you know, modern technology or just the mere appreciation of the effectiveness of these uh, uh, methods? Um, yeah, yeah, this is a big dilemma in that one cannot blame a fisherman for using the most efficient gear available to him. So, you know, if it takes him a month to make a, uh, a net uh, and he can instead go and buy one from the local store, if he's got the money, uh, then he'll buy one, uh, especially if it's more efficient. Um, the biggest problem, though, is when people who don't own the resource and aren't custodians of it come in use super efficient methods, um, basically rape the resource and then leave when it's overfished. And the, the local people are then left with a resource that is greatly depleted. So, you know, a very important issue is to control access to fish stocks and give preference to people, to local people who are custodians of that resource. Yeah, yeah. Do you find that, and I think this is just an interesting point, just flowing from the point that you just made, obviously law and order is trying to, their laws and policies preventing these invasive ways of, you know, fishing and um, trying to conserve, you know, these resources. Do you find that there is effectiveness in implementing those policies and laws that are in place? And if not, what are the obstacles that prevent uh, such? Well, that obviously varies hugely across the continent, but you know, a lot of fishermen in rural areas live in remote places. They live in places that are difficult to access. So it's, it's, it's not easy to implement the law. So, you know, the implementation must really come from the people themselves. They need to have an ethic of a sustainable use. Now, I can remember meeting an old fisherman up at Cozy Bay, and he explained to me that when they make their uh, palisade fish traps, he uses his finger to measure the gap between the sticks because he knows if the gap is that big, then the juvenile fish can get through, they can go and breed, and then they, he will sustain uh, the harvest. But he noted that younger fishermen who don't uh, observe that, they make the trap, the, the gaps narrower, uh, they catch more fish, but they also catch more smaller ones, and that is not sustainable. So it's so important for us to capture the wisdom of uh, you know the older traditional fishermen and ensure that's passed on to the next generation and um, ultimately self-regulation of the fishery is, is going to be the way that makes it sustainable we can't rely uh, on uh, the authorities to implement the rules in in, in deep rural areas yeah yeah um, I think you speak of, you know, capturing the knowledge of uh, those that came before us. And one way that I saw, which was really interesting in your presentation, uh, the paintings on tombstones in Egypt, those are really interesting. But uh, I, I was just keen to know, are there other ways that one can, you know, uh, that we can go around conserving these traditional methods of fishing? Well, you know, for instance, the Pongola, uh, the Isifonia um, basket fishing, I think that should be restored, not only to harvest fishes, but also as a tourist attraction, which will generate income for local communities, where these giant fishing drives are reorganized, tourists can participate in them in the, at their own risk, people harvest the fish, and uh, they get paid you know, by the tourists. And that's been done, for instance, to uh, maintain traditional fishing methods in Japan, those cormorant fishermen. Mm -hmm. uh, there are very few of them that are commercially fishing. 95% uh, of them are doing the fishing for tourists to see, and they, they, they paid for oh. that. And the same mm -hmm. occurs in the very specific islands and in New Zealand, where fishermen are, are paid by tourists to demonstrate uh, their knowledge and, and their, their traditional technique. So that's, that's one approach. Um, but, you know, there is a strong awareness in South Africa from the government level, the CSIR universities of the value of indigenous knowledge. Centers of excellence in IKS have been set up. Uh, there's a national database that's been established. 
So, you know, the authorities are, are well aware of it. We've just got to do more on the ground uh, by recognizing, you know, where the most um, innovative techniques are still being used. And I document them in detail in my book and, and, and put focused effort onto conserving them. Because as um, you said in your introduction, to me, it's just as important to conserve the traditional methods of harvesting fish sustainably as it is to conserve the living resource itself. And the one actually helps the other. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And interesting, I mean, I think throughout your um, presentation, I was just thinking, wow, because all um, the methods that are, we, we used are innovative in their own nature. But in your own opinion, which one is the most innovative uh, method? According to <laughs> okay, <research. laughs> wow. That's a tricky one because there are so many of them. But I'd like to mention, I, I talked about fish poisons. And there's a fish poison that I came across uh, that's used actually um, up in Limpopo, where, um, and this is what they make the poison from, powdered wood from the dogbane tree, the sap of milk uh, wood, euphorbias, crushed scorpions, the saliva of rock lizards, toxic caterpillars, snake venom, and toad secretions. And they're all mixed up to make a deadly poison. But also some of these um, traps which have got rattles on them, some of these traps which are, are fall traps where the activity of the fish inside the trap causes the trap to close. You know, there are amazingly innovative things that, are, that have been invented. The vertical screens to catch jumping tiger fish. Mm. But you know, probably once again, I go back to the Palisade fish traps of Cozy Bay. They are, to me, they should be a world heritage site by, in their own right. Um, they are magnificent and uh, we need to make every effort to conserve them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, interesting, um, interesting. I, I was just looking at those, you know, communal uh, fishing sessions and I was just saying, wow, <laughs> you know, and uh, you just bring this aspect that some of these um, practices can actually be recognized as tourist attractions, as, uh, as heritage sites. I think it's, it's really a big, uh, a big, um, when we speak, I guess, blue economy, I don't know if it's part of that uh, when we look at tourism. And I think it's something that definitely we should be, we should be considering. But out of interest, and I guess as we get uh, towards the end of this session, uh, do you find that the traditional um, fishing methods employed here in Africa are the same as those that are employed abroad? And if not, is there a specific reason why? Yeah, I found that there's a lot of commonality between uh, traditional fishing methods in Africa and in Southeast Asia. And there's some commonality with South America. Um, bow fishing is much more common in South America than is in Africa. But the Afonia thrust baskets, for instance, um, I've only found them in Asia. I haven't seen evidence of them in South America. Um, of course, in the Indian Ocean with the Dows, uh, you know, plying the seas for at least a thousand years or more, uh, that allowed uh, people to, to, you know, share knowledge and share experience. That was less available to, uh, in terms of, um, you know, meeting up with people from South America with the big Atlantic Ocean in between. So, you know, it makes sense that there would be more in common with uh, Southeast Asia. But I lived in, in Bahrain for a while and there I found very similar valve traps um, and crab tracks and so on being used in Bahrain and also um, in Qatar and Kuwait uh, than uh, the ones we use um, in Africa. And just to yes. go back to your previous point, um, you know, we, we make a big effort to preserve traditional dancing and singing um, mm. and music. Um, pottery, um, artwork, and so on. Why don't we include a, a, as one of these traditional activities that we want to conserve traditional fishing methods as well? Yeah, yeah. Very interesting point. And uh, thank you very much, uh, Prof. I think Anina also sharing the same uh, sentiments and, and saying that interesting uh, presentation. Thank you very much, Mike. Um, 
Yeah, uh, I just wanted to ask you, I, I, I know that you had uh, some remarks. Do you have any further like closing remarks that you'd like to leave on the subject? Following this talk, I'd like to encourage people to take an interest in this topic. Uh, wherever you live, go and look at uh, examples of traditional fishing methods, go and look at the tidal fish traps in the Southern Cape or the stuff up in Zululand, read about it. Um, you know, and when you're involved in conservation, whether it's cultural or natural history conservation, bring these traditional fish uh, methods into your, your discussion and let's, let's include them in our efforts. Yeah, very powerful. And I think something that you mentioned earlier on before we started this session was to say, also academic institutions, if they could put, you know, more students researching in these areas so that there's a whole big body of knowledge around, uh, around uh, traditional methods of fishing. I was amazed that your book is one in 50 years uh, that is uh, doing, you know, ex extensive looking at, ex extensively looking at this subject. So yeah, think really, thank you very much for that. Uh, thank you, thank you, thank you for the time, for the knowledge shared. Um, and uh, at this point in time, I just want to just thank our audience. Time is the thing that is running away from us. We, we don't have it in abundance and the hour mark has just rushed past us. But I would like to take this opportunity to say, uh, please do visit our website. There is more of these exciting informative sessions. Um, please do visit our website. Uh, it is updated on a weekly basis. There you can see what is coming in. Please sign up. There is any of the sessions that you missed previously please do also go there you will um, find it beneficial to peruse because there's a whole wealth of information there that uh, is, is there for your convenience thank you so very much once again thank you to you prof and uh, thank you to you viewers on facebook and here on zoom uh, from me here in tromsbeck and from prof who is in cape town good night and enjoy your evening